We, I'd like to introduce Megs Booker, who, was, uh, who just recently retired as one of the directors of the 1990 Institute. And she's an award-winning uh, play director, theatrical director. Let me bring her up. And she will take over from here. Hi. Am I on? Can you hear me out there? OK, I don't need this. Uh, at any rate, Nima and how? Oh no. I want to say I am so delighted to be here and to introduce David Henry Huang to you. I've known David since 1984 when he came to uh, work with us on a production of The Dance and the Railroad in Seattle, Washington at my old theater in Taman up there. And so it's, it's just great being here. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about David. I'm sure you know quite a bit. But if you don't already, uh, let me tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he is, to put it simply, one of our major American playwrights. He has been awarded practically any kind of distinction one could get, whether it was the Rockefeller, the Guggenheim, the Tony for M. Butterfly. The Tony, by the way, is the equivalent of, of the Oscar for the theaters. He's gotten three Obies off Broadway awards. Uh, and he's very recently, in the last couple of years, gotten the major awards for distinction and lifetime achievement in the theater, the Pell's Award and the Steinberg Award. And these are not small things. And uh, I'm so delighted because to me, he's, he has been a major groundbreaker in the Asian American community. Um, at any rate, you may or may not know this, but David has also been the go-to book writer for uh, opera. He's done four operas with Philip Glass. And I understand there's going to be a premiere at San Francisco Opera in a few years. So you want to keep your ears to the ground about that. Uh, he also has written the book for several Broadway musicals. So there's nothing that he really can't touch. I mean, he's done screenplays as well. So it's a really broad history. On another front, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about him personally, and to do a little bit of a walk down memory lane, if you will. Uh, David is a Westerner. He was born in Los Angeles. His parents were both uh, Chinese immigrants, so he does share the immigrant story with uh, all of us and uh, the American story. And so uh, I think I'll come over here for a minute. Um, at any rate, uh, he was born in Los Angeles, eventually uh, went to Stanford, and then from there to the Yale Drama School. Uh, you're going to see, because we actually have some clips from way back then, uh, David premiered his first play while he was a student at Stanford in his dorm. And it was called FOB. And it was about FOBs and ABCs. And it was a great beginning because it's about three students, two of whom are ABCs and one of whom is uh, fresh off the boat. And it's their humor, their conflicts, their issues that really uh, spoke to him, I think, very much at the time and probably still do. Uh, at any rate, so from Stanford, the play uh, in, in early form went to the O'Neill Theater Center in Connecticut. And from there, it was picked up by Joe Papp at the Public Theater. And then we will start to see a big change in his career with uh, many plays done at the public. And uh, I'm going to walk you through that just a little bit, uh, all the way through M. Butterfly, getting the Tony new plays about uh, uh, east-west uh, differences and, and joint interests. Uh, and you will see that in Golden Child, where you see the, the cultures of the west and the east really in contrast. And then uh, finally, I think most of you 
actually got to see Chinglish at Berkeley Rep last year. And so you know that we're talking about <laughs> very sophisticated comic writing, and we're also talking about what can get lost in translation when you really want to communicate. And the theater really is above all about communication. And David, I think, is a real personification of what uh, communication and tying that to 1990s mission is really all about. The more we communicate, the better the two countries and also all of us here in the US get along better and make progress. And here's David. Okay. That's really good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Well, I guess we should ask David as a starter, how did you begin writing? What got you interested? Yeah, um, well, as Megs was mentioning, I went to college here in the Bay Area. And um, so as a freshman, we would uh, you know, get bussed up to see shows here in the city. And um, I remember going to ACT and seeing, I think it was uh, a production of Winter's Tale and Thornton Wilder's The Matchmaker. And part of me thought, oh, you know, maybe I can do that. So I started trying to write plays in my spare time. And I found a professor at Stanford who was willing to take a look at them. And he said they were really bad, which they were. And my problem was that I wanted to write plays, but I didn't actually know anything about the theater. Uh, but the same professor was a good guy and helped me kind of design a playwriting major at a school that uh, didn't have one, I think still doesn't have one. Um, and um, then I wrote a play, this play to be done in my dorm um, my senior year. And, um, and Rick and David were involved in it. And David, yeah. you can see, in the, in the, he was in that picture. Um, he was, he played the original, he originated the role that John Lone later played in New York. Um, yay. Yay. So that's, that's how I got started. Great. I think uh, there's something I'd like to lead you into and have you kind of take off on this. So I showed you a couple of pictures from Dance in the Railroad. And at, at that time, which was 1984, there was not a large community of Asian actors available in the professional theater. And that show is a good example because of the, the uh, two actors who played the part. One was Japanese, who played the coolie, and the other one was Chinese that we brought from Hong Kong just to get the skills of Peking Opera. And you could see the acrobatics, the martial arts background. What I'd like to suggest and get David to talk about a little bit is I think he's, he's been a real groundbreaker in terms of writing roles for Asian actors and in just opening up the whole world of entertainment and media. And uh, I'd love to hear you talk about that and hear about maybe some obstacles or... Yeah, I mean, look, I think that most of us in this room uh, would feel that, you know, if I ask you, are you happy with the degree of representation of um, Asian characters, uh, Asian faces in our mainstream media and our mainstream uh, film and television? I think most of us would feel that uh, no, like, you know, that film and television uh, still in, uh, in America lag behind uh, in terms of representing the society that we all live in now and that um, the, the film and television tends to be, you know, still very Caucasian oriented um, and many minorities are underrepresented, uh, particularly Asians. So then the question becomes, okay, well, what can we do about that? Because I think that most of us would feel that we're underrepresented and that it would be nice and that it, it's important to have these images out there. So um, I think this, I mean, I don't know that I write specifically to change the balance of representation. I think I write because these are things I'm genuinely interested in. But it does happen that uh, to coincide with, I'd like, I want to see more faces and, uh, that look like me and look like my kids. And um, I want to see a, a greater diversity of stories 
And it's not just benefiting Chinese Americans or Asian Americans, I think. It's really that America in general uh, needs to understand uh, and benefits from understanding different kinds of cultures and different stories. And not to mention the fact that if you look at movies now, if you look at television, uh, America comprises a much smaller piece of the overall gross and, and uh, sales for a cultural product than it did 20 or 30 years ago. So it's also a question of American product appealing to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and China recently became the second largest uh, movie um, market in the world. They just surpassed Japan. Um, and they will surpass the United States um, in, I don't know, I want to say 12 years, but I'm kind of just making that up. Uh, but it, I mean, but it is going to happen. So it really benefits everybody to have a wider diversity of stories that we tell in our mainstream media. Good. Uh, that's one of the things that I've noticed that I think is uh, very interesting. And starting way back with FOB and Dance and the Railroad, you're very much talking about Chinese in America, the issues in uh -huh. the Chinese community in America. And then when you move to M. Butterfly, all of a sudden we went to an international story. We did a little gender bending and that the, peaking, the opera star is really B.D. Wong, a man. Uh, the event based on real, a real life uh -huh. uh, incident with a French diplomat in love with the uh, opera star. Uh, all of a sudden we're starting to get into a much broader situation. And uh, Chinglish is an example, Golden Child is an example, and it, it seems to me that you are really looking at uh, uh, Chinese and Chinese Americans now in a really global way. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, I guess I feel like I started out writing about the stuff that's closest to me. So um, I was writing about Chinese American stories. And then as the years went by, and particularly with M. Butterfly uh, being an international story, then I started to find, oh, there's, you know, I'm doing some international or internationalist, if you will, kinds of stories, and then some kind of American multicultural stories. So there are those, those two different strains. But at this point in my life and career, I look, the US-China relationship is going to be, if not the story of the 21st century, certainly one of the major stories of the 21st century. And I feel like I'm interested in it. I have some insight into it. I mean, I don't really know China very well. But you know, um, I, I feel I can at least humanize the characters. Um, and I want to learn more about it by writing more about it. I mean, that's how I learn things. I kind of get interested in something, and I, I write a play. And in the process of writing a play, I learn more about how I feel about it. So um, it's, it's hard not to be tempted by the idea of writing more about the US-China relationship, um, because it's so vital and so in the air right now. Do you think you might be doing that with your upcoming work? Uh, David has been a uh, resident all this last year at Signature Theatre in New York. And this is quite a special thing because the theatre chooses only one writer for the entire year of productions. I mean, this is very special. And so uh, David has, has done a couple of productions there already and he's working on something new and it's called Kung Fu. You want to talk about that? Yeah, OK, so Kung Fu is um, a play about Bruce Lee. And um, I had started wanting to do a show about Bruce Lee in the mid-90s. And I contacted Linda, um, the, the widow, and Linda was incredibly supportive of this. And so through most of the aughts, um, I worked on trying to create a Bruce Lee musical. And um, I worked with, you know, I had like a great Broadway team and everything. And we just couldn't get it. It just wasn't any good. Um, and so that team kind of dissolved around, uh, around uh, 2009. And we just, you know, we just sort of gave up on it. And then I thought about it a little more. And I thought, you know, the problem was that we were trying to make it a musical. Because every time you try and make Bruce Lee sing, <laughs> it was very kind of South Parky in not a good way. Um, so then I started to think, well, 
why couldn't you do a show that I'm now kind of calling as a, like a dancical? Because it's got a lot of movement. It's got martial arts, right? And it has dance that's, in, that's martial arts influenced. And all that is underscored with music. But nobody actually has to sing a song. So that you can, like a musical, you can have a, you know, have a scene, and you can have a number. But the number is all movement. Um, and so once I came up with that idea, then it was relatively easy, finally, to write a first draft that I was really happy with. Um, and so, yeah, we go into rehearsal. I mean, I'm going, not, next week we start a two-week workshop. Um, and then we go into rehearsal for the actual production right after New Year, and we open on February 24th. Um, and one of the big challenges was to try to find someone to play Bruce. Because, you know, if you don't have that, then you don't have a show. And at least in this version, he doesn't also have to sing. Um, but uh, we, we uh, are, we're sort of thrilled that we finally found someone who we think is pretty great in the part. Um, and um, I, don't, I guess I can say this. Um, if, if it, does anyone watch um, So You Think You Can Dance? Yes. OK. So Cole. yeah, Cole. Right. So Cole Harib, who's from season eight of So You Think You Can Dance. Um, <laughs> and who had a dance style, you know, who's been a martial artist all his life, and also had a dance style that was influenced by martial arts. Um, and we brought Cole out in the spring to do a, a, a workshop, an initial workshop. And you know, he's less experienced as an actor than he is as a, as a dancer martial artist, but he made enough progress that we were really excited about him. And, then, and all the movement stuff looks fantastic. So yeah, Cole's, Cole's going to play Bruce. Okay. Other than the fact that Bruce Lee uh, was a martial arts pro and broke into the movies, what else interests you about him? What's in his story that there are a couple things? You? I mean, number one, I feel like those. Of, I mean, you know, I'm a baby boomer, and so that I've lived through this period where the image of China in the West has done this 180 degree shift, right? Like when people our age, when we were kids. Um, China was sort of poor and uneducated and dysfunctional and the sick man of Asia and all that kind of stuff. And now China's obviously, you know, if there's anything people worry that they, there's too much money and too much power. Um, and so Bruce Lee comes along as a cultural figure right at the moment when the perceptions of China start to shift um, into what we now call, you know, new China. And he's the sort of first pop culture embodiment of that. And to some extent, I would argue, anticipates the kind of, you know, the new strong China that's to come. Um, so that interested in me. And then also, I think I'm finally old enough that um, I, I felt comfortable kind of exploring um, Asian masculinity. Uh, because it's very <laughs> tricky, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think those of us who are Asian men, you know, we grew up in America, and then we we're sort of used to the idea that we we're emasculated, and you sort of deal with that one way or another. Um, but you know, what is sort of a positive way to to, to conceptualize Asian masculinity? Um, and one can argue various things about the the images that Bruce Lee created, but it is certainly true that he, out of thin air, created this idea of having an Asian male hero, uh, in the West anyway. And um, you know that's mm -hmm. an incredible accomplishment. And I wanted to kind of look at the unlikeliness of that um, in, in, in a show. Are you also uh, considering the, uh, the past history that Bruce Lee had actually invented a series for television? Well, I mean, called okay, the, Fu, right. I mean, the, the reason the play is called Kung Fu is because it, it covers um, Bruce Lee's years in the U.S. So it covers from 1959 to basically around 1971, um, and kind of ends with the uh, story, the the idea that he creates the television series that eventually becomes Kung Fu, but then obviously, as we know, doesn't get cast in it. So. Um, in a way, to call the play Kung Fu is to try to reappropriate the t television series Kung Fu uh, in the context of the person who actually created it. Okay. I think some, some people here might be very interested in hearing how 
you approach a straight play versus a musical or an opera. What mm -hmm. are, you know, the different requirements and uh, since you do have both writing and musical background, he really does play a mean violin. Uh, there's a lot of background here on both sides, and I, that too shows in Yeah, I mean, work. I think that when, you, when I do a, a, a musical or an opera, um, structure is a, lot, is a very big deal, because musicals and operas are about co collaborating with other creators. If you do a musical, you're collaborating. I mean, I'm the book writer, so-called, so I write the script. Um, and then I'm collaborating with the composer, with the lyric writer, uh, with a director, sometimes with the producers of all the Disney shows. The producer is very active. Um, so how do you get on the same page? And the only way to get on the same page is to be very rigorous about structure, uh, which means, you know, in a practical sense, um, outlining the show, what happens in this scene, what happens, and everybody argues about it, and every, you know, everybody kind of tosses it around. And, and you come up with a structure that all the collaborators can own uh, you know, to, as, as, as their own um, creation. A play is much more, a play is really personal. A play, I'm the only one who's creating it. Um, so it's really kind of an internal exploration. And I like to basically know where I'm starting and where I'm ending. But other than that, I just kind of like to follow it along. And it's almost like, you know, when it's going well, it's almost like I'm listening to other people. I'm listening to the characters out there someplace in the universe and just kind of taking dictation. Okay. How did you approach revising the old Rodgers and Hammerstein flower drum song? Because I know you updated this. Yeah, so, uh, some of you have come up to me tonight and said that you've, you, know, you saw flower drum song, I mean my flower drum song, um, when uh, it was either in LA or on Broadway or um, in um, San Jose, right? Sunnyvale? San, San Jose. Um, and um, that was an interesting project because, okay, who, who I assume most of you guys know Flower Drum Song. I like you've heard of Flower Drum Song. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Flower Drum Song had this sort of fantastic Rogers and Hammerstein score um, and had gotten kind of clunky and nobody was producing any, it anymore. And you can argue it's just, you know, that it was stereotypical, it was outdated, or it was just that it was not the best Oscar Hammerstein book. Um, it, you know, he, he was kind of starting to be ill at the time that he wrote it. And he eventually, you know, he died fairly soon after. Um, but for whatever reason, Flower Drum Song had fallen into, into, fallen off the face of the earth. And it's the only musical, the only American musical that's ever been done about Chinese Americans. You know, you have a fair number of musicals that are set in Asia. But in terms of Asian Americans, Flower Drum Song is it. So, I, I felt, you know, like it's kind of sad to lose this. Um, and there is, was, there is a move, was a movement then, and it continues to be the case, that there are a lot of revisicals on Broadway where you basically take the old songs from a musical, like everybody likes the songs, but nobody likes the story. Um, so various people take the old songs and create a new script, and it's called a revisical. Um, so I thought, well, you know, why can't I do that with Flower Gum Song? And, um, I got to collaborate with C.Y. Lee, who wrote the original book, and I wanted to go back more to the spirit of the book. Um, and it's one of the you know, more mm -hmm. fun, th it's, mm -hmm. it's like one of my favorite things that I've done. Great. Would you, we have a lot of people here tonight who have, uh, uh, I can't call them children anymore, but sons and daughters who are getting close to college or in college. Would you recommend uh, that they might go into the entertainment business? Okay, like a lot of times when I'm fortunate enough to talk to a, a groups that include large numbers of Asians, <laughs> uh, this subject comes up. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's great if you, you know, I, I, I'm fantastic that you honor me or Joan or, you know, what if people who honor Ang Lee or Amy Tan or whatever. But really the people that need the support are those who are coming up. And I think that if we can all agree that uh, on the idea that, that American media right now is not sufficiently representative and we would like to see more of our stories and we would like to see more of, of faces of people who look like us, then, well, you know, somebody's got to do that. Um, 
And I think a career in the arts, people go, you know, the arts are unstable, but what's really stable? <laughs> um, you know, and, and I think that if, if a kid has a passion to do something, even if it happens to be your kid, um, <laughs> that, um, that that's important. Because if you, if, you, if you do something that you love, you're likely to work harder on it. It doesn't feel like work. You put in a lot of hours. You have a lot of passion. And you, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years now. And I, every day, I'm still very excited to get to do what I do. And I think that that's an incredible blessing. And by the way, I have a 17-year-old son who wants to be an NFL place kicker. So I completely <laughs> understand your pain. <laughs> At this point, I'd like to open up the floor for any of you who'd like to ask David questions. Anything goes. There's a microphone. There's a microphone going around. Yeah, Where I'm okay it? with embarrassing questions too. So you can just yeah, yeah. If you raise your hand, I'll come to you. If you would raise your hand, that would be great. We can pass you a mic. Please oh, don't be shy. We got one over here. Okay. okay, it's coming. It's good for the whole audience to hear the question. Thank you. Thank you. I was just wondering, what um, part of AIDA did you participate in? That was a very surprising and very Oh, yeah. I know I've done a few musicals for uh, Broadway musicals for Disney. So AIDA was um, a project that uh, Disney had been working on with Elton John and Tim Rice. Um, and they did an initial production in Atlanta, which didn't go very well. So um, Disney being Disney, they fired everybody, except for, <laughs> except for uh, Elton and Tim. Mm -hmm. And they brought in a whole new team. And I was part of the new team. So um, I rewrote the, the script. Um, and we you know, opened it on Broadway. And uh, it ended up doing OK. More than five years. Yeah. Yeah. Another question? Don't be shy. He's right here. So I was just curious, how do your plays play in China? Yeah. Well, I, that's a very good question. And I have been, I've had plays that have been done, you know, my plays are done pretty regularly throughout Asia, but I had not up until very recently had a production in China proper um, that hadn't been shut down. I mean, there, there, was an <laughs> there was an attempt to do M. Butterfly in Shanghai um, about five years ago, and it got shut down. Um, but um, just this past, uh, this past spring in May, we brought the signature theater revival of Dance in the Railroad, the, the show that um, Megs had produced um, in Seattle to the uh, Wuchen Festival, which is a, a new theater festival that you know, takes place outside Shanghai. And um, it, 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 went, it was actually pretty fantastic, because uh, they did a really great job in terms of refurbish, re, refurb, refurbishing a bunch of theater spaces. So the idea of taking a show that, had kind of, that has a Chinese opera component and getting to perform it on sort of a 600-year-old Chinese opera stage was pretty awesome, and the audiences were great. And so, you know, I hope that now I'll get to do more work in China. How Aida's about, been all over China, by the way, but in terms of my personal work. How about Chinglish? Well, here's, OK, Chinglish, we were thinking Chinglish could maybe be done in China if we had the right, you know, sort of connections. Um, and then the Bo Xi Lai case happened. <laughs> and then Tina Brown, you know, everybody was kind of going, oh, Bo Xi Lai is just like Chinglish, except, you know, Chinglish is funny. Um, <laughs> and, um, and Tina Brown had me write a story about the similarity. And so, which really helped the play in the rest of the world and does not help the play in China. So maybe a few years down the road, we can do it in China. You did do it in Hong Kong. We though, did it right? in Hong Kong, which was yeah. really fun because there's so many bilingual people in Hong Kong. And I feel like if you're, I mean, those of you who saw the show, a lot of you are bilingual. So I think it's a lot more fun to see the play if you actually understand both languages. Hmm. Question over here.
Yeah, um, the, you know, the, the, those of us, a few of us probably remember the, the sort of only attempt that that's been tried so far in terms of at least an Asian American family was Margaret Cho's show, uh, All American Girl, which lasted about a season and a half. Um, and Margaret tells a lot of stories about how difficult it was. Um, the, I mean, it probably, you maybe could get a Chinese American sitcom on these days. Um, I happen to know that there is, does any, do you guys know who Eddie Huang is, H-U-A-N-G? He's a chef who has, he's sort of in his early 20s, um, but he's become really, uh, he's created this big kind of media um, empire. Um, and he has an autobiography out called Fresh Off the Boat. He appears a lot on the, on the, uh, the television show Vice. Um, and I just heard that he has, he sold a pilot to ABC based on his book. So. Um, I don't know, you know, that might be coming down the pike. We'll see. Hmm? Any more questions? David, did you, uh, anything you wanted to comment on? You haven't had a chance to? Uh, no, I mean, this, I mean just, you, you know, I, I really believe in the power of um, arts and culture, and I, I appreciate all the programs you're doing. Um, and those that relate to arts and culture have a special place in my own heart. And, you know, it's so easy for us to, we, um, we're talking about these preconceptions and the kind of sound bites that we get of each other um, if, if, between the US and China and various countries around the world, um, which tend not to be particularly humanizing. Um, they tend not to give you a three dimensional picture of who people are on either side of the Pacific. Um, and I think the arts do. I think culture does. Um, it allows us to relate to each other as fully three-dimensional human beings. And that strikes me as a, a kind of profound way to make a connection and a long-lasting way to build real relationships. So um, thank you for all you do, and um, with a particular place in my heart for your arts and culture programs.